copy this link and put it on your Facebook page. Let's get others involved in this morning study. We're going to have a word of prayer and move right into this morning. Do we all have our study guide? Amen. All right. All right. Let us, <clears throat> let us, let us pray. <clears throat> Merciful Father who art in heaven, we are here once more, Lord, not because of mere formality, but we, re we re realize the hour is late and the end of all things is at hand. And we do not now reflect the image of Jesus as we should. And we ask, Lord, even now that through this morning's study, it will help us to make a complete surrender to Christ and have him work his perfect will in our lives is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> All right, we are continuing our series 1844 re-examined and what? Reaffirmed, right? We are on a journey, brothers and sisters, through this series. Let me just put this mic here, right? And we have said that in order for us to get to 1844, we have to go through a whole lot of other um, studies, right? And so we are on the Feast of Unleavened Bread. I know it says it should be F. Now, we have been on this feast now for over a month. Yes, because they're actually, and believe it or not, you know, I've, I've kind of sketched out this, this series. There are seven feast days, right? And as we approach them from three, three perspectives, historically, Christocentrically, and personally, I have deduced that by the time we are done, Sister Esther, we're going to have approximately probably 37 studies. I think it is the most intense, intense work that I've ever seen done on the feast days. And so we have, a, we, we have a ways to go. We're not rushing it, and God wants us to learn. Amen? Now, friends, we're on lesson F. It's a typo F. We have one more installment left next Sabbath, and then we're going to transition to the feast of First fruits, right? A wonderful feast that God has designed for us to learn about Christ and salvation. Now, friends, the sanctuary, we realize that out of all the doctrines that we hold, I don't believe no other denomination has a firmer grasp on this subject than do we. We were birthed out of the sanctuary, man. It's a wonderful study. It's a study where we haven't even touched the iceberg yet, right? But I believe that, as David says, salvation comes out of the sanctuary, man. And so 1844 is a part of the sanctuary, right? But we have to get through uh, Pentecost, unleavened bread, first fruits. Isn't that right? Uh, that, uh, uh, to get to 1844, which is the feast of day of atonement, right? And friends, we've said that there are some books I want to encourage everyone to get. You know, you cannot be a member of this church and not read. Did you hear what I say, friends? You're going to have to learn how to read and these are books that have been given to us by our pioneers. Um, very good books that we can use that will help us to better understand the sanctuary, its service, and how it relates to salvation. And friends, my favorite of them all is The Cross and the Shadow by S.N. Haskell, right? A wonderful book. And he, has a, he does have a chapter on these feast days, right? And then The Great Controversy. Right? Even Ellen White had um, devoted a few chapters in that historical book that deals with the sanctuary service, and she does touches on the feast day, right? And then we are promoting this book. Um, we still have a few copies left. It's, it's, it's free. Um, the feast days. Um, there are many Adventists who still believe that we should, we should celebrate the feast days, not in the anti-type, but in the type, Right? And I don't argue with them. I just pray for them and try to give them some text and move on because, trust me, they're almost, in some cases, you can't even reach them, right? But we still love them and we still pray for them that God will have them see the light in regards to these feast days. We've learned that now that these feast days, while we don't celebrate the type, we realize that there are great blessings in them. Isn't that right? And because they give us incredible insights, in the plan of salvation and redemption. And friend, we've said that if you want to see Jesus in all his splendor, I challenge you, I dare you, view him through the lens of the, these seven feasts. Right? And so we're looking now at the Feast of Unleavened Bread, 
We've been on this feast now for, this is going to be about seven lessons. Now, why seven? Because remember now, out of all the feasts, they were one day feasts, except for which two? Unleavened bread and what? And how long were they supposed to celebrate these two feasts? Seven, seven days. So you could imagine if you're celebrating something seven days, there's a lot you can glean from it. Isn't that right? And so as I begin to study and write, there's so much we can learn from the Feast of Unleavened Bread as it relates to our lives and our walk with Christ. Right Now, again, we've said it is good, a good practice. As you study these seven feasts and any other doctrines that we hold, we must approach them from three perspectives. Every text, every doctrine, whether it's a topical study or a textual study, you must approach these from three perspectives. One, historically. You have to do the historical work. You can't just jump to the contemporary. And the historical takes time. The context, the culture, the original language, what was happening, why did Moses write this and so forth, right? But we can't stop there. We have to now transition to Christocentrically. How does this doctrine, this text, or these feast days apply to Jesus Christ? But we can't stop there. We must now transition to the practical and the personal because if I know this, what change will I make in my life? How will I adjust my relation with my family, a society, to make me a better Christian in the world, right? And so we are approaching these seven feast days from three perspectives, and that is why we have so many studies, right? Now, we've learned, friends, that it's not just head knowledge God wants. He does want a heart transformation, right? And as admin, we don't like knowledge. I think we like the relationship part, right? In some cases, right? And we're told, friends, she says, those who have assumed the what? The ornaments of the sanctuary, but are not clothed with whose righteousness? Christ will appear in the shame of their what? And friends, we don't want this to happen to us. We want to be clothed with Christ's righteousness as we look at the, 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 the feast days right now. Our thematic text, we've been looking at these two texts now for weeks. First Corinthians 5, 10, Paul says that, Purge ye out the what? The old leaven, that he may be a new lump, as ye are what? Unleavened. So Christ desires for us to be unleavened. Not leaven. Right? And then now, Galatians 5, 9, Paul says, a little leaven doth what? And we've showed you a little leaven. Man, this is why we're here today. Right? And leaven is sin. We've discussed, friends, that um, once Passover happened on the 14th of Nisan, the 15th was the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And so they never had time to prepare. They had to prepare for for Passover with unleavened bread. And that is why you find that the, the, the New Testament authors, they oftentimes liken unleavened bread as the Passover because right on the 14th, then came the fifth. For seven days, they had to eat unleavened bread. God designed this to teach them a powerful lesson. Now, we're going, we have learned thus far that all these ceremonies, right, of the feast were types and the work of Christ. So we can see Christ's work in restoration in these things. Now we're going to move right into our study now, right? We're on lesson number F, and this is the second to last installment of this particular series. We'll have our last installment next Sabbath, and then we're going to transition um, to the Feast of First Fruits. Now, we're told, we know this, friends, that no leaven was to be in the homes of the Israelites prior and during the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Now, there are two texts I want us to focus on as we, as we look at Exodus chapter 12, verse 15, and Exodus 13, verse 7, because Moses actually repeats himself. But Moses now, what he does now, he repeats and he enlarges. Now, question one, we're filling in the blanks for those who are here for the first time, and we're going to move on. Right, number one says now, what are the three ways that Moses speaks of leaven? All right, Nathan, you have a pen? All right. Three ways he uses them. Now, look at the text now, right? Fill it in now, right? Note now. In Exodus 13, verse 5, he speaks of leaven personally, which means, fill it in now, right? Having no sin in our lives. We've covered that. That's the whole um, teaching of this concept of leaven. Leaven 
right? Unleavened, leaven, leaven, right? Is sin. We don't want sin in our lives. And we've covered this, right? Jesus, it is said in John chapter 14, verse 30, Jesus says now, well, Moses says, pardon me, in Exodus 30, he says now, unleavened bread shall be eaten seven days, and there shall be no leaven bread be seen, what? With thee, that's personally. In other words, no leaven should be on thee. And I could imagine, if, if, if you were like me, when, you know, when we were little boys and we had our food, we put some in our pockets, isn't that right? You put a piece in your pocket, and you, you hide and eat, and crumbs would be in your pocket. Now, could you imagine a Jew? He would have to empty his pockets, because there's no way he could walk around with 11 in his pocket celebrating the feast of what? And I believe that the ladies, if they had those, um, you know, Gucci purses and Chanel, they would have to, you know, they probably bought a little, a little slice of bread for the children at church, you know, right? To feed them. And so that bread had in leaven. So they had to enter their pocketbook. So it was incumbent upon the Jew to have no leaven on them during that time. Meaning we cannot have sin on us and in us. Jesus said this now in the book of John 14, 30. He says now, hereafter, I will not talk much with thee, for the prince of this world cometh and hath what? And he is now de denoting the sin concept, right? We are told, please read now, in the book Great Controversy, she says now, but Christ declared. But Christ declared of himself, the prince of this world cometh and hath nothing in me. Uh-huh. Satan can find nothing in the Son of God that would enable him to gain the victory. All right. He had kept his father's commandments, and there was no sin in him that Satan could use to his advantage. So no leaven. There was no leaven on Christ or in Christ. You see that, friends, right? Now she transitions to us as we wait upon Christ coming. She says, now, please read now. This, this is the condition in which those must be found who shall stand in the time of trouble. So, friends, we cannot have leaven leaven in us no sin and there is a, a doctrine that is very pervasive amongst us now which teaches very subtly that we will be sinning when Jesus comes friends I would run from a preacher who teaches that I would not sit under that man's teaching because he is an unfortunate person we must and we will and we can gain the victory over every sin whether hereditary or cultivated, friends. And there is ample power and provision made for us to gain the victory. Right? I like what Spurgeon says. Mrs. Spurgeon says now, he that is saved hates sin and loathes it. And though he committeth sin, it is by infirmity. And even when his will giveth consent unto sin, yet it giveth a still deeper and more confidence confident assent unto the law and after it hath sinned he moaneth and bemoaneth it ex itself exceedingly uh, on the account of sin so he is a man even though he sins with a low ban, he doesn't take pleasure in it he moaneth and he bemoaneth himself even in the act he's saying lord have mercy forgive me and that is the attitude we must have if we fall into sin he says now I love this. This is probably one of my most, my, most, my most favorite quotations by Spurgeon. If you saw a fish in a tree, you know he was not in his what? Element. And if you see a Christian in sin, you will be able to discover that he is not in his element. He goes on to say now, If sin be pleasure to thee, if thou canst sail down its streams and rejoice in it, canst drink its draught and make merry with those who make merry therein, then deceive not thyself, thou art not a Christian. I don't care how long you've been in the church. You are, if you can make merry in sin and laugh at their dirty jokes, then you are deluded. You need to wheel and come again, somebody say. Very serious. He says, if if, you know, Jesus likens us as, as a matter of fact, you know, God always likens his people as clean animals. The wicked are always compared to unclean animals. He says now, if you, if, if you see a sheep fall in the mire, 
It is quick to enough to up again. But if a swine falls there, it wallows in it again and again, and nothing but the whip and the stick can grise it out of it. He says so, that there is an essential difference between the righteous and the wicked, even in their sins. A righteous man falls at seven times, but what? He gets a part of that thing, man. He can't live it. He got to get out. I got to get out of sin. But as for the wicked, he rolls and revels in his sin, abiding and continuing in it. He will die with leaven in his persons. And friends, I tell myself every day, it's something I have to remind myself in my journey. And if you don't remember anything I've said this morning, let this be your takeaway point. You cannot sleep on Delilah's lap and expect to wake up in Abraham's bosom. No way, no way, Bob. No way, no way. No leaven. No leaven can be in our persons. So Moses now uses leaven's personal. You see, friends, now, this is where it gets a little bit technical. Friends, I had to look long and hard for this one because it was in the text. Moses uses leaven in a second context now. Fill it in now, right? In Exodus 13, verse 7, he speaks of leaven commercially. Uh-oh. Commercially. It's in the text, you know. Commercially. Which means having no sin in our business dealing. It's right in the text, Elder. And I, when I saw it, I said, boy, Moses, you see you, you're tricky for him. <laughs> this thing is serious. And that is why the, this feast was so, was so lengthy. Because it, 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 it encompassed our entire being. You see, leaven was used commercially. Meaning that we have to be, there can be no sin in our business dealings. Now look at the text now. Look at it's right in the text now. In Exodus 13 verse 7, Moses says now, Unleavened bread shall be eaten seven days, and there shall be no leaven be seen with thee. You see, that's personally. With thee in your pocket. No. Then he says now, neither shall there be leaven seen with thee in all thy. No, that word quarters is not in the single, it's in the plural. Quarters. And I stopped and I looked at that. Because in another place, he says no leaven in your home. So why, why are you going to say home and then quarters? And friends, it dawned on me what Moses was implying. In um, John Gill's exposition of the Bible, now John Gill was a contemporary with Charles Spurgeon. Actually, you know, I tell you a story. I was in England. I was at Bunyan's, John Bunyan's grave site. And I was, it, 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 people are taking pictures of, you know, Pilgrim's Progress men, right? And it's a nice cemetery. It, nice means it's, it's historic, right? And I'm walking around and walking around. And guess who I saw? John Gills. I'm like, that's, that's, that's John Gill. Remember, England was rich in religion. I was like, that's John, John, the bones of John Gill rest there. I mean, you may not know who John Gill is, but if you, if you study the Puritans, he was a contemporary, he's a powerful expositor. John Gill now comments on Exodus 13, verse 7. And friends, it blew my mind. Quarters. This is what John Gill said now. Please read now that quarters. Please read now. All thy quarters, which were to be diligently searched for that purpose, and every hole and crevice in them. All right. And not only their lower rooms, their dining rooms and parlors, uh -huh. but their upper rooms and bedchambers. Uh -huh. Because it was possible a man might sometimes go into them with a piece of bread in his hand and drop or leave some of it behind him. Yea, synagogues and schools and place of business were to be searched, since children might carry thither leavened breads. And this search was to me be made by the light of a lamp or candle, not by the light of the moon, mm. if in the night, nor by the light of the sun, if in the day, Mercy. but by the light of a lamp or candle, and not by the light of a torch or of a lump of fat or grease or oil, but by a lamp or candle of wax. 
And this search was to be made at the beginning of the night of the 14th of Nisan. Mm -hmm. Yea, it is said that leavened bread was forbidden from the seventh hour of the day. And that is one o'clock in the afternoon and upwards, which is the middle of the day. So when Moses says in all thy quarters, he was implying that the average Jew dwelt in several places. He had his home, but then there was a school. You see, you bring lunch to school. You make a peanut butter and PBJ sandwich. Yeah, 11 breadcrumbs is there. After school, you go to your father's home, workplace. Huh? You may have a half a sandwich there. So you eat some sandwich and you leave leavened bread there. So when the Jew was now preparing to remove leaven, he had to consider all his quarters. Let me backtrack. Not just home. I must go to the synagogue, the church. Not just church, I must go to the school. But not just school. Uh oh I have my business, and my son came last week. Let me go and see if there's any leaven there, friend, you see? So this concept of leaven is not just a home. It also applies to business. Do I have leaven in my business transaction? Jesus was a carpenter. Why did he choose a profession? Someone said because he knew he had to make a ladder high enough for us to reach heaven. Now, you must understand now, he was an entrepreneur. He had his own business. Isn't that right? And I, I, I could imagine, as a Jew, maybe Mary may have brought some bread, because bread was the staple of food, and leaven was in the bread. And I could imagine Jesus getting ready for the Passover, along with Joseph, saying, you know what? Let's go to the shop. Let's make sure we have no unleavened bread no leavened bread in our business. Friends, you know, it speaks to a wider thing that as a carpenter, we are told, he was not defective in his craft. Could you imagine? Could you imagine in Nazareth? He's putting out chairs, him and Joseph. And a man come down Nazareth Lane. And he walk in a certain way. And he said, what happened to you? He said, you know, I we go by this Jesus shop and Joseph. And the man sell me a cheer. And when I went home and sit down to eat, it break and I hit my hip. And I went back to him and I come tell me, he said, no warranty. <laughs> Could you imagine what kind of reputation that would have on Jesus? They would say, listen, Jesus and Joseph, their, 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 their furniture are defective, brothers and sisters. You see, friends, are we defective in our business transaction? Look what she says. Jot this reference down. Not in your hand. I probably should have put it in. But jot it in. Fundamental Education, page 4. Seven. She says, now, he learned his carpenter trade. He learned the carpenter's trade and worked with his own hands in the little shop at Nazareth. Uh -huh. The Bible says of Jesus... Quote, and the child grew and waxed strong in spirit, filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. Here's the punchline now. He was not willing to be defective, even in the handling of tools. Mercy. He was perfect as a workman, as he was perfect in character. So if he was not defective in his tools, he did not make defective furnitures. He didn't sell defective things. There was no leaven, even in his commercial dealing in Nazareth. Friends, I ask you, no leaven also means that we must be upright. If you are a business, you must be blameless in your business dealing. You charge a man a dollar, on the receipt, you can. When you go the next day, it's something else. Paul says this now, that we ought not to be slothful in business, but fervent in spirit. What did the apostle mean by not be slothful? Don't be slack, loose on fear. Huh? 
Don't do that in your business dealing. No. The Apostle Paul is admonishing the early Christian church on the correct attitude to maintain in serving God. He says, be not slothful in business, meaning they should not lag in zeal, but fervent. The word fervent is used in the context and translated from the Greek word zeal, which means to boil with heat for liquid and to glow with heat for solid. That means there is a boiling in our spirit with the word of God and a glow on the outside, which means we are on fire for God even in our business transaction. You buy, you sell, you fix, you make. You have to be fervent. We've all heard this phrase. It means above board. You heard it? What does it mean? Is your business this morning above board? It really means legitimate, honest, open. You've oftentimes heard the clay, cliche that I will never do business with another who? Say the Adventist. All the time. And then what happens now, it's called ascending liability. One crooked mechanic does something wrong. And then we'll say, them, the mechanic, they are, them are crook. One man you know, charge you for, he charged you for an engine, all you need was a spark plug. And uh, we, they now condemn the entire Adventist mechanic or carpenter. Friends, we cannot have leaven in our business. The eighth commandment is very, very broad, you know. Thou shalt not steal. And as you look at it from the, from the context of Patience and Prophet, Mrs. White now expounds. She says it condemns theft and robbery. It demands strict integrity in the minutest details of your business. Then she says now, it, 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 it forbids overreaching trade. You know, not saying you can't make a profit, but come on, man. What you want, profit, house, land, boat? Huh? It requires payments for just debts and wages. Pay the man what the man deserve. You know how we do it, man. You, you, you go to the man, you don't even ask for a discount because you ain't getting none. You know when the man shows up to your house, what he charges there's no wiggle room. But a brother shows up, do something for me now. Huh? Come on, man. We know we, 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 we're brothers. Brother who? Brother what? Huh? Pay the man and not be... Let me tell you something. A friend of mine told me a story. It happened to him. He came to America on the Underground Railroad. You know what I'm talking about, right? And he had to live a long time on the Underground Railroad. And somehow he got a, he got a job with an Adventist guy. Right here in this state. And because the guy knew he wasn't straight, the man was paying him $4 an hour when minimum wage was 8 And to get the four dollars of our payment, and the man didn't want to pay him. And to add insult to injury, the brother was a vegetarian. <laughs> Nothing is more wicked than a healthy sinner. Huh? Tofu eating, soy milk drinking, green juice drinking. Huh? Wickedness, man. Not because. You see, she says it declares that every attempt, and I, this is serious now, to advantage oneself on by the ignorance. We know in the business world, what you don't know, you snooze, you lose. On the ignorance, I mean I don't know, weakness or misfortune of another is registered as fraud in the books of heaven. You know, when we were trying to find our country property, we saw a place and you know, I said, okay, we're going we're to move to it. So I said to the lady, okay, I didn't know what land is for. I didn't know the first thing about buying a piece of land. I just said, okay. I said to my cousin, what do you think it's worth? She said, well, you know, I should, wrong person. I asked him, him a crook. 
<laughs> so I, that's where I went wrong. He said, honestly, you know, I would, I would give her more than 1.5 mil Jamaican, which is about 15,000 US. I said, okay, fine, you know, you know, okay, you know. Gave her that. And, you know, so we got the law, everything, and um, when the government went to evaluate the land, Jesus have mercy, it was almost four times the value. I said, what? <laughs> and then they charged me tax, not on what I paid, on what them think it's worth. And you know the thing never, the lady was a good lady, man. She grew me. She taught me Spanish. They must gracias, and senor. They must gracias. They must gracias, persomo. I learned that song in that home on that land. She's from Belize. Yeah? And it never sit with me. No. So I said, boy, I got it. I mean, I, I, didn't, I didn't purposely gym street woman. And she didn't know. I didn't know. So I said, okay, what, what am I going to do, Lord? And the Lord said, okay, just take care of all the fees then. So I paid for the survey, I paid the lawyer fee, I paid the advertisement, I paid the survey, I paid everything I could just to give myself. Because she should have gotten the land surveyed. But we didn't know, I didn't know about no survey, just take the cash and give me the money, I'm saying. But friends, my point is friends, are we above ground? in our business transactions, when we deal with people, as you pay your workers, as you do your job, are you, is there leaven in your dwelling? And you can sit there and deceive yourself all you want, or let some man tickle your fancy. Mr. Spurgeon says, a just God cannot bless unjust transactions. He's not gonna bless it. No leaven personally, no leaven commercially, in all thy dwelling, in all your dealings. It's better to take a loss yes. than to bring the name of Christ into reproach. Yes. Better go back and redo the job. Just to satisfy the religion of Christ Amen. and the reputation. Amen. Just take one for the team than to have them castigate you as a crook. Now, the third way Moses used leaven, personally, commercially, in Exodus 12, 15, he speaks of leaven domestically. And it's where I'm heading now, which means having no sin within our dwelling, within our home, your house, your structure. Three ways he speaks of leaven. Personally, no leaven on thee, with thee. No leaven in thy, all thy dwellings, thy quarters, it says. But then no leaven should be in your home. And we're going to talk about the home this morning. The structure, your castle, where you retire to at night. Right? Here's the text. Put away out of your houses, no leaven, right? What I've discovered in the church, especially amongst conservative people, is this, this principle. Fill it in now. There are many who are zealous about keeping leaven, sin out of the church, but they are not so zealous in keeping leaven, sin out of their home. The energy is not the same. It comes to the church, hold on. That's what the prophecy says, Bible says, church manual says, and rightly so. But when it comes to their dwelling, that don't, that don't apply to me. It doesn't apply to me, casa, my house. And it should not be. Now watch it now. Number two now, what rests upon the home house of the wicked. 
Something rests upon a home where leaven is in. Look what David says now in the book of Psalm, Proverbs 3.33. Uh, Solomon says now, the curse of the Lord is in the house of the wicked. Stop there. There is a, not just a curse. It's not just a man-made curse or the curse of the Pope or the curse of the city. It is the curse of the Lord. This is a divine curse that rests upon the house that perpetuates leaven, sin. It is. As a matter of fact, listen, we don't have time to go through it, but listen, there is over 30-something curses that Moses highlights in Deuteronomy chapter 28, verses 15 through 68. These are some serious divine curses that rest upon the house of the wicked. Cursed in the city, cursed in the field, cursed when you're going out, cursed when you're coming in. Vexation and sickness and stroke and man. You read it at your leisure. A divine curse. And guess, guess what? If a divine curse is on it, only a divine hand can remove it. If God put it on you, only God can take it off you. A divine curse. I don't care where the house is. Gated community, that don't mean nothing to God. You see, a divine curse. And that's why David says, now, we don't read these texts, you know, because we've entered the age of just grace and love. David says that God judges the righteous and God is angry with the wicked. Every day he's angry with the wicked. Now he said, how do you qualify that with John 3, 16? Huh? I believe that they complement each other. They don't contradict. He's angry at the wicked every day he's angry. Thus saith the Lord. We are told, friends, the house of the wicked. She says, please read, no, I know nothing. I know of nothing that causes me so great sadness as a prayerless home. Mercy. I do not feel safe in such a house for a single night. Did you hear that, friends? Mm. She says she don't feel safe in a house for one night where prayer is not her. Mm. And then now, look what she says. She says, uh, uh, were it not for the hope of helping the parents to realize their necessity and their sad neglect, I would not remain. I'll get me a hotel or a motel or a holiday in than to pitch my tent in a home where prayer is not heard or offered. God is not prized. But, but, you know, we love and love and love and love. That's living in the house, friends. Living. Now, turn the card over. Question number four, three now says, in regards to the home of, or the house of the just, what does God do with such a home? Go back to the text. The text says now, if the curse of the Lord is in the house of the wicked, but he blesseth the habitation or the house of the just. Why? Because these homes are bereft of living. There is a, he blesses that home. A blessing rests upon the home of the just. A home where sin is not practiced. And you know, such a home, Job says that the Lord puts a hedge. A hedge. Better than ADT. And door ring and whatever you camera you can have. You know, I got some cameras and my man said, not your cameras are out there. You need to get the round one. They can see round the corner. <laughs> This is better than any camera. This is a wall of protection. Angel says, and what's the angel with flame and fire and camp around that home? Amen. You heard a story about a missioner, a missioner who was sent to the Hebrides Island. He was sent there to, to convert the, 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 you know, the, the, these quote-unquote pagans, the, you know. And, and one night, the, 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 the chief came 
True story. The chief came, John Patton, his name was, came to burn the man's house down because he was evangelizing his people. And when he came there, at that time, the Paytons were locked in prayer. And when he came there, he said, man, he just turned back. So years later, the chief got converted. And they would say, you know, that night when we came to your house, man, we came to burn your house down. You know? so he said, what, what, what prevented you? Man, we saw them giants. They were big giants. And they were like, no, no, there were no giants there. Me and my wife alone. The angels encamped. A true story. Out of the habitation of the just brothers and sisters. Because the home is bereft of leaven. You see, look what Spurgeon says. I love it, friends. Like he says now, he who fears the Lord comes under divine protection. Even his roof which covers him and his family. The Lord preserves and prospers and provides for that home. His home is a place of love, a school of holy training, a place of heavenly light. In it there is a family altar where the name of the Lord is daily held in reverence. As a result, the Lord blesses his home. It may be a humble cottage or a lordly mansion, but the Lord's blessing comes because of the character of the inhabitant, not because of the size of the dwelling. Whether it's plywood or zinc fence, talk to me now. Huh? The Lord blesses that habitation. Let's go a little further now. Is a house dedication biblical? I remember, I kid you not, when we were at Acreage, I was going to dedicate a home. And I went there and, you know, prayed and sing and so forth. And, you know, I'm leaving the house and a pastor, that time I was working before the conference, pastor calls me and he said, no, where are they? He said, you know, I'm going to come from a dedication. He said, maybe dedication. He said, no. He said, host. He said, host. He did them foolish, he said. No. That's what the pastor said. I wouldn't see He said, you did them foolish, he said. I'm like, I, I, I didn't know how to answer him. <laughs> to him, it was foolishness. To him, it was foolishness. I was shocked. And from that day, me and that man, we don't talk theology. We just talk high and by. I enter into no theological debate with him because I know where his mind is. And he has one of the biggest churches in Fort Lauderdale. The man call it foolishness. Them they are old time something. Is it? Note, the practice of home dedication has its roots in Old Testament. And I wouldn't advise anybody to move into a home or an apartment, a townhouse, without dedicating that home to the Lord. It's biblical. Dedication of a house or apartment to the Lord is, a, is practiced by many Christians uh, today. In dedicating the house, the residents are making a statement to themselves and to the Lord that this is the house, his house, and that they are committed to protecting from evil and evil influences. It's a biblical practice. Don't let these neo-Adventist pastors deceive you. It's a good practice. Give it to the Lord. Accept the Lord. Keep at the house. Build the house. These are biblical texts. There's an ample text there that, that give it to the Lord. Now it's true. There's no biblical pres pres prescribed. You, you can do your work, you work your own thing. You can do it yourself. If there's no pastor there, you're the priest of your home, aren't you? But it's a biblical thing, friends. It's a biblical thing. Now watch it now. According to Moses, upon entering the land of Canaan, what should the Israelite not bring into their homes? Now here's now. 
For 40 years, they were in the wilderness. They had no physical structure. They had tents and boots. When they got into Canaan land now, the Canaanites were hardcore paganists. paganists. They were pagan from the top of the head to the big, big toe. Everything them touched like King Midas was pagan. And they're entering into a new land, a new housing scheme. Huh? Huh? And the Lord gave them an admonition. Friends, all scripture is still inspired. And this, and I'm going to tell you something. You see, the people who are at last saving God's kingdom will take this text literally. This was not nailed to the cross. It is a bona fide cogent text. Moses says now, Neither shall thou bring an abomination into thine house. That's leaven. Don't bring it in. Why? Lest thou be a cursed thing like it, but thou shalt utterly detest it, and thou shalt utterly abhor it, for it is a cursed thing. That's leaven. Don't bring leaven in your home. Now you say not an abomination. What's that? The Bible tells what abomination is and are. Jot this text down. A few verses forward. Same Deuteronomy verse, chapter 18. Moses says now, not in your handout. When thou art come into the land, Canaan, which the Lord thy God giveth thee, thou shalt not learn to do after the what? In your house. He said, don't, don't learn, but don't bring it in your house. What are they now? Thou shalt not be found in your among you that sun pass through the fire, divination, observer of times, enchanter, and witches, neither a charmer, consult of spirits, wizards, necromancer, for all that do these things are what? An abomination. Full stop. And one of the things I love about this church, we are not what we call New Testament Christians. We believe in old and new. Sometimes. Yeah? When it's to baptize them, all scripture, all and new. Huh? When it comes down to us, maybe we'll put it one day. I thought Moses, all scripture is given. No, then please read now. It should be. It should be the goal and objective of every Christian to keep their homes free from all abominations. That's your brelin. Whether it's a apartment, whether you rent, own, bill, lease, trust, whatever you dwell in. Please read now. In its wider sense, an abomination is anything that dishonors God and glorifies the demonic kingdom, uh -huh. defiles a person, gives access to demons, or otherwise takes glory away from God. Friends, this is serious. Your home is your castle. You shouldn't have anything in your home, whether in by art, paint. I used to love art. When I was in school in Philly, I think I could have been. And one of my favorites, I like impressions, you know, and one of my favorite artists was Auguste Rodin. And he did a sculpture called The Thinker. It's a man, yeah? Buck naked, huh? Yeah. 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 Birthday suit. Yeah. And I remember we, I purchased our, our Gus Rodan and I had it in my office. Yeah. Because I am, I've arrived, I'm an artist. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and you know, one day I was reading early writings. And the servant of the Lord describes she saw Satan. And when she saw him, I said, what in the world? <laughs> he had his hand on his chin. He was in deep thought. His eyes receded. And he had a grin on his face. And I'm reading early writings. I'm looking at the thinker. I'm reading. I look at the thinker. That thing went down the garbage chute. I'd rather err on the side of caution. Call me fairly God, you what? Right. And that man was buck naked yeah. in his nude, a grown man. Nudity. Got rid of it. Friends, I've got, now you, you can rush that's all you want. I don't know what or who inspired Augusto Dan. 
understood. Well, if it's nudity, you know who was behind that. Because God is trying to clothe people, not expose them. Eh? So, friends, we talk about games. What are you bringing in your house? What are you playing at your... No, listen, friends, I'm, I'm a real. Sometimes we want to we wanna just unwind. Isn't that right? The Bible says, much study, we raise the flesh. Sometimes we want to just relax. But even in our relaxation, we must glorify God. And friends, there are certain amusements I do not practice, and they are not permitted in my home. And our kids, we know this. There's no argument. We reason with them. Yeah. Now, they have games that they play and so forth, Egypt, the king, and all that. We, we do have fun, but we cannot violate Scripture. Because you do not want to be possessed by a demon. Amen. And I've seen ample people. Friends, it is no joke. It is no joke to be possessed by a demon. I've had several encounters with demons and them. Dialogue. Frightening. Scary. And you wonder how, where and when they left the door open. I'm telling you. The last one we had an encounter with... You, you challenge them, you know, what is thy name? I am the demon of sex. A woman, deep, muscular, bass voice. How did you get in? Oh, she watches soap operas. You think I'm lying? You, can't, you, you, you call Pastor Dijon Tull, the secretary of the Bermuda Conference. He was right there, or right behind me, or at the door. <laughs> Took off. Literally. Literally. Lying to you, my buddy. These said, no, we didn't get this in seminary, boy. We didn't take that class. Literally. And the girl was an Adventist. Educated. She was our co-worker. Yeah. Literally possessed by a demon. Demons. And then I said to them, you have to leave. Don't rush us. Yeah. Us. What is thy name? Legion, for we are many. I'm not here lying to you. As God is my witness. You better believe it. So what cards? What, what, what's so bad about these things? You see, you have to go back and do the historical work, friends. 52 cars in the year. That ought to ring a bell. Listen. Four suits. Four seasons. 52 cars, two weeks in the year. 13 cars, each suit, that is astrology. You don't have to go no further with that point right there. You don't need to have no GED to get that one. That's just one, two, three in that order. And that is why Ellen White says now there are, jot it down, there are amusements which, listen, such as dancing and chess and card playing. And you know what she never, she never lists? Dominoes. Because I, I, did, I, I had to say, okay, why? Because dominoes is not a Western game. It's a Caribbean game. But et cetera means and such like. Huh? And why are the dots on the dominoes are black and white? The yin and the yang. You know this. You should know. I hope you know this. We cannot approve because heaven, that's the triune Godhead, he condemns them. These amusements, they open the door for great evil. Friends, we cannot bring these things in our home. Don't let them tell your foolishness. Huh? No, please read now. False gods, such as what? False, false idols, uh -huh. as statues, images, paintings of false gods. Uh -huh. Items used for pagan worship ceremony. Uh -huh. Items used for witchcraft uh -huh. and sorcery. Uh -huh. Item used for divination uh -huh. or necromancy. Mercy. Items used for spiritualism. Uh -huh. Detestable behavior in the home, uh -huh. such as adultery, sexual immorality, wicked schemes, whether practiced of view or viewed in movies, books, songs, etc. You know, you know, one of the things that I think is a demise amongst us, I was in the barber shop yesterday getting Nathan haircut. And there's an Adventist barber, so we support him. So we're talking about the lady who, who was put forth by the Democrats for the judicial system. Supreme Court. Jackson. Mr. Jackson, Sister Jackson. Huh? 
and the barber shop went quiet. And one guy said, yeah, man, she get my vote. Yeah? Another one said, yeah, man, a time for free our people. And I realized, you know, if we're not careful, you see, we vote because of skin color. Yeah. Yeah. So this is in, in, in the great controversy, you cannot let skin color sway you. Now, friends, I, I watch the, 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 the proceedings. And some of the way the woman stands. But you know, anybody that them's put forth, put a question sign. Because the them, 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 them demoralizing. And they give you some money, but at what cost? Right? Yeah. They give you that stimulus to stimulate you in wickedness. Yeah. Yeah. We know how it is. And I said to myself, you know, honestly, if this is where she stands, religiously, morally, I don't care if she was Kunta Kinta grandmother from the motherland two times two. There's no way me as a commandment keeping Christian could elect her. No way! But we don't see that. And I say this to say this. You see, as people of color, I was in a home, I've been in his home, you know. And they're, they're, they're wealthy people. Every year they go to exotic vacation. I was there. They said, Pastor, stop at dinner, we're having lunch. Pastor, we went to Cairo. I said, Cairo where? <laughs> Cairo, Egypt. Huh? On camel and the Sphinx. And she said, look what we brought back from our ancestors. When I look, I say, Lord, I need to eat my lunch to go. <laughs> the doggy bag. These are established people in the church. No, I'm, not, I'm not here condemning them. They're nice people. But friends, you see what trumped them? Because of Africa and civilization. Huh? And they forget that 90% of them were, were, were. Come on. Friends, be careful what you're bringing home in the name of black or Hispanic. I don't care what your genealogy is. You can't let that trump this. Amen. Cannot. Amen. And so we have these paintings and these books and the motherland Africa. You know what? That was baptizing paganism. The Bible said, don't bring it in your house. You say, now you're extreme. No. This is extreme. Acts 19. Let me tell you how serious these Christians were. Today you do this, Ella Brown, they say, you, well, you, 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 you follow it not. Huh? You're, too, you're, too, you're too rigid. Acts 19. The Bible says now, and this was known to all the Jews and the Greeks, also dwelling in Ephesus, and fear fell on them all. And the name of the Lord Jesus was magnified. Now when it's magnified, look what happened now. And many that believed, came and confessed and showed their deeds. What deeds? Bible says now in verse, and many of them which also used curious arts brought their books together. Where were their books? Had to be in the home, in the business, somewhere among them. They brought them forth and burned them. They didn't give it to the, to the, the, the thrift store. They burned those books. They put fire to it. Abominations. Magic. You ought to read Ellen White's comment on this. Blow your mind. Acts of the Apostles. You see, friends? And so today, we allow any and everything to go on in our home as Christian parents. And we use this little sick sentimentalism um, privacy. My child needs privacy. The Bible says a child left to himself bringeth his parents shame. I'm paraphrasing. What are your kids watching? What are they viewing? Friends, I'm telling you, you know. And I come to realize, this is the people who are at last saving God's kingdom. The people who are at last saved in God's kingdom. I'm going to use a strong word. They are obsessed with Jesus. And the Bible says this now. With all your heart, 
or your soul or that's obsession they are obsessed with Jesus and his liberty serious friends listen I'm telling you you may have to go and have to go home and have a conversation with our children we don't argue we don't fight we just talk come I mean, no one listen, but we, we can't continue. So put, put some suggestion forward. Involve them in the conversation, yeah? yeah? This not, not going to not gonna work. So let's get some options now. Friends, no living should be seen. You talk about tough love this morning? There is a thing as tough love, you know. God put his children out of the house. Adam and Eve can't stay here, sir. I love you. No. It not going to work. When an adult, and give me the key. Yeah. yeah. I'm being real. Put a flame and sword. No, it not going to work. It's not going to work. We're not adult. We're not have to change or conform. We love you, but we love God more. Amen. Friends, we have to become what we are obsessed with Jesus. You see the people who make it in sports? You look at the, the Lionel Messi, the Ronaldo. Huh? These you call them goat. Kobe Bryant. You think that man was sitting down eating Fruit Loops? Huh? 100 jump shots. The man were, these men were obsessed with their sports. That's why they live on. Their legacy live on. I mean, you sell a, you sell a, a, a body armor drink, $300 million. That's not looking like change, you know. These men were obsessed with, that's why they stood above the crowd. And the people at last who are, I'm talking to myself, who are, who go, how about 144? Do you know who those people are? No guile was found in them. Them people are rare. Brooks says, you talk about them, you might wonder where God's going to find so many. They are obsessed with the kingdom of God and God's teaching. God first blinders. One away may attract God and God only. We need to get back. And you know what? I'm telling you, it will have an effect. Have an effect. Yoga in the home. What are we doing? What are we doing? Yoga is union. It means to be yoked to the God of Brahma. And my mother... Yeah, got in trouble really one time. I was living with her and I, you know, I was living on fire. Fire that blazed too, too, too hot. <laughs> so one day, um, some books came at the house and I said, I said Yoga? What is it? Dash it away. <laughs> Boy! <laughs> it wasn't really my house, probably should have done that. So later on, we, she, said, she said, But when you practice yoga, I only do the stretches. I said, Mommy, the stretches are yoga. Each pose is a salutation. There are 12 salutations. Why 12? The zodiac. It's not, you think, think it's just, just, Brahma just got together? That's when you got to understand. These things were Canaanites worship. Huh? And then, you know, we deceive ourselves with these little... And I, it is, mm. She'll grow out of it all the time. It's a phase they're going through. Friends, hear me. Sin is not like a pair of denim jeans. Nobody grows out of sin. Yeah? We grow into sin. Yeah? And as we change, so sin changes. And that is why we are told what we don't overcome will in turn overcome us. And friends, if we are not gaining the victory over sin, rest assured, sin is gaining the victory over us. I'm talking to somebody online. And as a result, so many Adventists 
we fall right back to the Israelites. We have sacrificed our kids to the God of Moloch. We do. We do. We, have, we are sacrificing and you are lost in the home. <sighs> Please read. Look what she says now. When, when we bring these things in our home, in our home, look what happens. She says now. Through devotion to worldly interests, Satan receives all the homage he asks. The door is left open for him to enter as he pleases. Here it is and just walk in. And look what he brings now. With his evil train of impatience, uh -huh. love of self, uh -huh. pride, avarice, overreaching, and his whole catalog of evil spirits. Walk in your house. Your home. Where God says in a time no leaven should be there. No leaven should be there. Joe Cruz said it right. No one can deny that there has been a, a weakening of our spirit. Tradition is now posture against wilderness. Under the influence of television, the Adventist lifestyle has become seriously breached and compromised. Practices once shunned as un unacceptable and intolerable in an Adventist home are no longer issues of loyalty to the faith. Friends, our homes should be a home of refuge. Running from the avenger of blood. A home of refuge. As we wind down, now what two things did the prophets desire to be in every home? And this is what God wants for every home. Those who are watching online, this is what God desires for your house, whether you own or rent, or pre-construction. The prophet says, And thus shall ye say to him, that liveth in prosperity and peace. Be both to thee, and peace be in thy house, and peace be all that thou hast. Jesus told the disciples, when you go out two by two, and you go into a house, inquire this. Luke 10, 5 now, and into whatsoever house you enter, first say, peace be unto this house. Friends, and I say it, you know, I don't know what it means, but if God says say it, you better believe I say it. Every house I go in, peace. I'm <laughs> saying, boy, go in the bathroom, peace in this bathroom, boy. <laughs> Literally, it's a part of me, peace. I don't know, but I just do it. I'm <laughs> saying. And if the son of peace, God, I love it, be there, your peace shall rest upon it. If not, it shall turn to you again. He says now, and in the same house remain eating, drinking, such things as they give for the labors of their worthy, of the him, go not to thy house, go from that house. Peace. Peace is indicative, indicative to unleavened. Peace. God wants peace and prosperity to be in your homes. The God of peace. Sanctify you. Yeah. God wants peace. You know, I, you know, we talk about this with my wife and friends. I tell you something, man. You know, this is what I desire for my home. This quotation sums it up. And we're on a journey. Yeah? Look at what she says now. Please read now. The home, the home. The home that is beautified by love, sympathy, and tenderness is a place that angels love to visit. Stop there. As they're about their business. 5570, apartment two. Let's, we have some time. We'll go stop here now. See where I'll go on, huh? See where Nathan up to. Ali Liz, they said, yeah, they love to visit. If peace and love and sympathy. Please read now, and where? And where God is glorified. Yes. Please read now. The influence of a carefully guarded Christian home in the years of childhood and youth is the surest safeguard against the corruptions of the world. Uh -huh. In the atmosphere of such a home, the children will learn to love both their earthly parents and their heavenly father. Friends, we want a home where angels love to visit. And there are some places where told angels do not go. 
And I wouldn't encourage anyone to go anywhere where he's got angel don't go. They are not commissioned, we are told, to go on certain grounds. Have you ever heard this statement in Greek controversy? It's so profound. The jig is over now. This is it. The great controversy is ended. Sin, leaven, and Levenites are no more. The entire universe is clean. Stop there. The entire universe is clean. I thought about it, friends. Let's go backward now. Fill it in now. Before God can have a clean universe, he must have a clean church. Now watch it now. Ephesians 5 says he's coming for a church without spot and wrinkle and any such thing. And before he can have a clean church, he must have a clean home, a home that is bereft of leaven. Sin, whether by thought or artifacts. Yeah. Well, somebody said, Lord, have mercy on me, Jesus. I need to go home and do some spring cleaning, house cleaning. Need to, need to hire Holly the maid, Molly the maid. No. What you need is Jesus. As I close, there's a story in the Bible about a home that was sick with sin. And what Jesus did to that home, I believe he wants to do to every home today. It's found in Mark chapter 1. Peter's home. Was a story. And, it, and it's amazing, you know, out of all the healing Jesus did, this healing was different. Look at the text now. Mark says now. And forthwith, when they were come out of the synagogue, they entered into the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. Look what happened now. Verse 30 says now, But Simon's wife's mother lay sick of a fever, and Anan, they tell him of her. A serious fear. She was sick. Sick with sin. Sin brings sickness. Violation of God's law. Yeah? Look what happened now. Gee, this is, a, this is a, a unique healing now. And he came and took her by the hand. Never said one word. Lifted her up. And not tomorrow or next week, immediately the fever left. We are told, when we ask for temporal blessings, God will delay or defer. But when we ask for deliverance from sin, immediately everything is stopped. Deliverance. And she ministered unto them. But look what happened now, once God healed the sin issue in that home. Verse 32 says now, And at eve, when the sun did set, they brought unto him all that were diseased, and them that were possessed of devils. Lord have mercy, devils. Plural. And all in the city was gathered Together at the what? With, of Simon's house. What happened now? You know? The Bible says now, and he healed many that were sick of diverse diseases and cast out many devils and suffered not the devils to speak because they knew him, friends. Could you imagine that house? What a house. Could you imagine your house? can now be a dispensary for healing. Spurgeon comments on this text. And he said this as I close. Our Lord desires to make your dwelling a center of mercy 
for the whole region. A little sun, a little sun scattering light in all directions. A spiritual dispensary distributing health to the multitudes around us. There is no reason except in yourself why the Lord should not make your residence in a city a greater blessing to it than the cathedral and all its clergy. He goes on to say now, Jesus cares not for fine buildings and carved stones. He will not disdain to come beneath your righteous cottage when he are rent one room, half a room efficiency. Eh? And quoting there, he will bring a treasury of blessings with him. This is the punchline now. He says, We shall enrich your house and shall ensure the riches of booms to your neighbors. Why should it not be? Question to you. Have you faith to pray this moment that it may be so? If every Christian here will now lift up his supplication quietly, Lord, dwell where I dwell. And in doing so, make my house a blessing to my neighborhood. Marvelous results shall follow. Then he says, now I love it, friends. Is there not one sick with you at home? What's the remedy? Take Jesus to such a person. Is there sorrow at home? Entreat your Lord to come home to help you in your distress. Is there no sin at home? Do you have a living problem in your home? In art, in movies, in books, whatever it may be. He says, I am sure it is there. All of us have some leaven in our homes this morning. Who can cast the first stone? Yeah. Whether by practice or neglect or by indulgence. If you look long enough and hard enough, it is there. Then he says, now, I am sure it's there. Take Jesus home to what? Purge ye out the old leaven. <laughs> remember, but remember, you cannot take him home with you unless you first have. Have him. And friends, that is the remedy for the leaven problem in your home. It's Jesus. If you take Jesus and his words and the counsel that he has given to us, and we are told, friends, those who overcome, be the price it may. They have heeded the counsel of the true witness to Laodicea. Oswald J. Smith once said, as I close, the light that shines the furthest will shine the brightest at home. Friends, home is where it begins. And home is where it ends. And as we near the end of time, the words uttered by Moses will become more near to us. Neither shall thou bring an abomination into thy home. My Jesus, Jesus, I love thee, I know thou art mine. For thee all the follies of sin I resign. My gracious Redeemer, my Savior, thou art. If ever I love thee, my Jesus, I love thee, I love thee, because thou hast first.
just love it and purchase and on Calvary Street I love thee for wearing the thorns on thy brow if ever I love thee my king let us stand to our feet I love thee in life, I will love thee, and praise thee as long as thou lay, and say when death, death thee lies God of mercy and compassion. We beseech thy throne of grace and mercy in the name of Jesus Christ. Confessing, O God, that we have allowed leaven to be in our homes. We have indulged in those things which brought down the wrath of God upon cities and destroyed nations. And God, we have come to the end of all things and we ask for mercy and strength to come out of weakness may we leave this place Lord more resolved and determined to make our homes a place where angels love to visit give us a fixed determination by your grace to remove any and everything that is abominable whether in thought or art or artifacts from our homes, thus making our homes little heaven on earth is our prayer in Jesus' name. And let the words of our mouth, meditations of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. And all God's people say, please sit for a quiet moment of